Thank you for joining us for the Hildale and Salem service for August 16th, 2020. We hope you are doing well and enjoying the summer weather. Today our message is coming from Reverend Christy Morrow, who is the assistant to the Bishop of the Eastern Synod. Let us begin. Praise, praise, you are my rock, the wind and waves are high, you hold me when the waves are strong, you hold me lest I die, I die, praise, praise, oh God, you are my rock, praise, praise, you are my rock, my desert sand is dry, you break the rock, the river flows, you hear me when I cry, I cry. Praise, praise, oh God, you are my rock. Praise, praise, you are my rock. You calm the fear and pain. One word of faith, and I am well. I rise to praise and walk again. Praise, praise, oh God, you are my rock. Praise, praise, you are my rock. You host the table set. We break the bread, we drink the cup. We know whom we have met, have met. Praise, praise, oh God, you are my rock. Praise, praise, you are my rock. The Easter grave is sealed. You roll the stone, you God alone. And sin and death are healed, are healed. Praise, praise, oh God, you are my rock. Praise, praise, you are my rock. You stood high on a hill, a holy cloud, you are on high. Be still, my heart, be still, be still. Praise, praise, oh God, you are my rock. In Isaiah, we hear that God's house shall be a house of prayer for all people and that God will gather the outcasts of Israel. The Canaanite woman in today's gospel is a Gentile, an outsider who is unflinching in her request that Jesus heal her daughter. As Jesus commands her bold faith, she how might our church extend its mission to those in margins of society? In our gathering around word and meal, we receive strength to be signs of comfort, healing, and justice for those in need. Let us join in confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust in your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us through your love, renew us. Through your spirit, lead us. So that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved God, or beloved of God, 
by the radical abundance of divine mercy. We have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for a hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, that's it for the Let us join in the prayer of the day. God of all people, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. That's it for that. Today's first reading is from Isaiah chapter 56. Thus says the Lord, Maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come, and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them, besides those already gathered. Today's second reading is from Romans, chapter 11. Paul writes, I ask, then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I totally feel where this Canaanite woman is coming from. Oh, do I feel her anguish and her desperation. Any of us who are parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, or who otherwise have children in our lives whom we love deeply can probably relate to this mother on some level. Her daughter is sick. She will move mountains, transverse long-held boundaries, cross lines, take risks, put herself on the line. She will do whatever it takes to make her plight known and to get help for her child. I totally get and relate to the mama bear in her. What I don't get, what pains my heart, what gives me a whole healthy dose of internal wrestling is Jesus' response to her. 
Over the years, various theologians and commentators and authors have made every effort to try and explain away first his lack of response, he literally ignores her, and then his eventual spelling out that in no uncertain terms is his ministry meant for her, that her status is akin to that of a dog, a foreign, unworthy enemy dog. To try and soften the blow of his words, some have explained that the literal translation of the Greek word dog in this case is actually puppy, as if this is somehow better. When in all actuality, it still leaves her under the table, eating crumbs off the floor. And if we're honest, Jesus' eventual response to her is difficult to hear and to explain away and it's not at all reflective of the Jesus that I want tucked close to me. The truth is, we may never understand what prompted Jesus to say what he did. He and his disciples had wandered into Canaanite territory, the land of the traditional enemy. They are the ones that had crossed the line between Jew and Gentile. One would think they would have expected to bump up against others who practiced a different faith, who believed different things. So Jesus, why, oh why did you have to go there and say that to this woman who more than anything needed your compassion and your care? There are all kinds of lines being crossed in this story. Jesus is a Jew in Gentile territory. He is deemed clean, she unclean. The woman is speaking to a man, emphasizing a gender divide. And she is speaking to someone who ranked higher socially than she did. Jesus was a rabbi, someone who had studied and learned. But it would appear as though his learning wasn't over. In his book entitled, A Way Other Than Our Own, Walter Brueggemann puts forth the idea that we are watching Jesus wrestle with his own vocation and the very extent to which he is being called to cross lines in order to help the other. Brueggemann writes, the woman is the outsider who instructs the insider. She explains to Jesus his larger vocation that he had not yet embraced. He learns that full faithfulness means reaching beyond one's comfort zone to the other. He now, in a new way, enacts the gathering of humanity. But what a road to travel to get to this point. Holding a line against another, being in a position of power and privilege without being totally aware that that's where you're operating from, being called out, being asked to reconsider, to come to know more in order to do better. Does this sound at all familiar? It should in this day and age. It was a happy time back in the early 1990s. A family had gathered to celebrate the 50th anniversary of its matriarch and patriarch, there were several activities planned in the weekend long festivity. Teas, dinners, a mock wedding, a square dance even, and family pictures. The entire family had gathered together to celebrate and since they all didn't gather in their entirety very often, you can imagine the boisterous noise of teasing and kibitzing going on. Arranging people for a portrait in this case was probably akin to trying to herd cats. But in arranging the family, the photographer chose to position people along the theme of light and dark, both clothes and skin. A number of family members are black and biracial and the photographer was essentially emphasizing a visual of the line that existed, but had not ever really been named or talked about in an obvious way. And so there everyone stood in a picture now frozen in time light on one side, dark on the other. This family is mine. At the time, I remember my 16-year-old self took note, but I didn't really know how to name what was happening and I didn't know how to stop it. I do now and I continue to learn what this means. When I spoke to my cousins about this sermon and using this story because it's their story more than it is mine, I had the opportunity to hear their experience of this time and what they remember and in some cases the pain they still carry with them. 
it was a helpful and important conversation to have, even if it took me 28 more years to finally have it. And I guess for me, this is another point highlighted in this story. If Jesus can get these hard conversations so wrong, what does that say and mean for the rest of us? It took me way too long to talk to my cousins about this because I felt like I didn't know how and I was afraid. And I think Jesus' response to the Canaanite woman is one that gives some of us pause for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is how we too can screw up these important conversations. If Jesus can get it this wrong with the Canaanite woman, if he can choose the wrong words, if he can approach her unaware of what privilege he may carry in that moment, it doesn't instill in me a lot of confidence that I, in my own position of comfortable white privilege, am gonna get it right. But you know, silence is no longer an option. We can no longer choose to not engage in these difficult conversations involving race, gender, and other blatant inequalities because we fear getting it wrong and being called out on that. Choosing not to is in fact condoning and participating in the maintenance of racist and unequal structures and systems that are still so ingrained in this world in which threaten the lives and well being of so many. On June 10th, Brene Brown, on her podcast Unlocking Us, hosted author, media producer, activist, educator, and racial justice advocate Austin Channing Brown. In their conversation, Channing Brown shared the following thoughts. She said, I tell people all the time that the work of anti-racism is the work of becoming a better human. That's the work. We're becoming better humans so that we treat other humans better. It's what we're doing here, even though it can feel terrible sometimes. But we're not interested in trying to hurt your feelings. We're not interested in trying to manipulate you. We're not interested in all the things that anti-racism educators get accused of. We are saying, I think you have the capacity to be a better human. Would you, could you accept that invitation? The Canaanite woman was unwilling to walk away from this conversation with Jesus. She pressed on even though I'm sure his words hurt her. But she pressed on because the life of her child was at stake. And ultimately what she offered to Jesus was an opportunity to expand his ministry to embrace all of humanity. To cross a line in order to offer love and care to all people. And for his part, Jesus hung in there even when the conversation was difficult. Jesus didn't allow himself to stay stuck where he was. He didn't storm away when the Canaanite woman challenged him. He is open enough to learn from her, a desperate woman who came from an enemy territory. He allowed her to pull him over that line that had been established by years of social and religious expectation and tradition. And Jesus meets the Canaanite woman where she is at, on her turf. He ultimately heals her daughter from within her own race, culture, and country. No conversion necessary. And this is where God's grace always meets me in this story. Neither Jesus nor the woman remain bound by the lines that divided them. The concept of ancient purity, race, gender, education. And even though Jesus didn't get the conversation right at the beginning, he stayed for the hard stuff. He was open to being taught and doing better. And the woman whose desperate and stubborn refusal to see her daughter made well, she didn't give up either. She believed in this man, this preacher, teacher, and healer, and the love of the God she knew he embodied. Are we going to get the hard conversations right 100% of the time? Not on your life. 
Do we still need to engage in these difficult but life-giving conversations? Yes, 100% of the time. Those of us who sit in a position of privilege are called to enter into these conversations in love, to walk alongside and be taught, which includes being quiet and listening, but then also using our voices to advocate for and with others, to become aware of our privilege and to use it as a means to rise up against injustice. It means being called out when we don't get it right, just like the Canaanite woman did with Jesus so many years ago. May it be so with us. Amen. When pain of the world surrounds us with darkness and despair, when searching just confounds us with false hopes start for meaning and destiny is there. We are called to follow Jesus and let God's healing flow through us. We see with fear and dread of intercession. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, you gather the church to be part of your mission as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. As Jesus acknowledged the great faith of a woman from outside his people, Help your church discover and find blessing in the faith of people we might reject. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have blessed us with the bounty of the earth. Grant your grace to all your creatures that the earth will flourish. Relieve waters choked by garbage renew soil stripped of nutrients, and refresh the air 
all creatures need to live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call the nations to be glad and sing for joy. Let your way be known among all the nations of the world, now divided by competing interests, contending alliances, and consumed by enormous worry. Bless us and make your face shine upon all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You show unexpected mercy, kindness, and generosity. We pray for those who do not have enough, for outcasts in our villages, cities, and towns, and for those who need your healing, especially those we pray for in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In you we live and move and have our being. Grant our congregation of Hilldale Lutheran grace to find our life refreshed in you. Accompany us in the rhythms of late summer. Give us rest and renewal and strengthen us for mission in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your eternal promises are more than we could ever imagine. As you gather all the saints, join us also with them on the great day of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us join in the prayer of offering. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Word and water, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts, that we might proclaim your steadfast love in your communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. The announcements for this week. Uh, thank you for joining us today as we hope you are feeling blessed. As our ministry goes on, the ELW will be doing a food collection once again for the gathering table food cupboard. Donations of non-perishable food items can be dropped off at the church before August 20th. Your donations can also be picked up. Just give Carolyn a call at 807-627-3370. I would like to thank those who have participated in the service this week, especially the music team and Sarah. Also Nina and Mary working behind the scenes. Let's join in the blessing. Neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you 
in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you.